Hello again there folks, Lone Adventurer here, thanks very much for stumbling your way upon my channel, joining me for another adventure. It's a big one, we're going to be getting into 2D6 Realm, which is an expansion for 2D6 Dungeon, a uh, dungeon crawling game from Toby Lancaster at DR Games. And 2D6 Realm is the Overland expansion, so it allows you to leave the dungeon environment, go out into the world, and do some exploration of uh, the world outside the dungeon. It also allows you to establish your own realm. Uh, you can lay claim to land. You can use that land to generate income, although you will have to pay taxes on that as well and you can do all kinds of different stuff. This is a chunky little game. So if we compare that to say, the original rule book, there's the rule book, and there is uh, the realm expansion. So we have got 262 pages here, so it's a bit of a monster. I have got myself the spiral bound editions. They are super high quality and it's gonna allow me to keep it easily open as we are filming this playthrough. As much as I love the original books, sometimes it got a little bit tricky to hold the book open because I didn't want to damage my spines while we were looking at the various tables. And here, if we're looking at a table, well, we can just open it and have it open like that. So that is rather nice. I got that at the same time as I got the Lair's Omnibus, which is the other book that has very recently been released. This has got Lair's Volume 1, Lair's Volume 2, and also the Haunted House, which is a Halloween-inspired special. But we're going to have to leave that to one side for the time being because this one is going to take all of our attention for the foreseeable future. Now, I'm not going to be making an exhaustive overview of this book. We're not going to be looking through it and establishing exactly what is inside it because that would be quite time consuming, I think. And there's probably one or two places on YouTube where you can get that already. My plan really is to try and get to playing it as quickly as possible. But that being said, we are going to have to have a little bit of a look at it. We're going to have to do a little bit of setup stuff. And we're going to have to have a little look at the various sheets that you need and will have to fill in in order to play this game. I will put timestamps in the description below so you can have a look at what exactly is in this video. And it might include some gameplay. You never know. You never know. We'll see how it goes. So very quickly to introduce the setting. It's set in the fantasy world of Corridine, as 2D6 Dungeon was set in a dungeon below Corridine. Corridine is a world where there is magic. It is ever present, but it is not commonly seen, somewhat faded from memory and uh, are not seen around the place. Realm is set in an area called the Heartland, which I guess is a region in the centre of Corridine. It's kind of nice. Meadows, heathlands, hills, forests, uh, small communities, stuff like that. It is a feudal society, so uh, all the land is controlled by different uh, lords and ladies. Those lords and ladies have to pay tax to Baron Cragfleet, who I'm guessing is this fella here. And Baron Cragfleet has a group of high actuaries and custodians, mullish custodians, who manage the money and taxation of the realm. So the idea really is to build your own realm, to have a bit of explore, continue levelling up your character, but you can also get yourself ready for the next step in 2D6 dungeon, which is going to be the legendary dungeon, a dungeon that's more dangerous and more challenging 
And in order to be ready for that, you will have to build uh, some mythical armor and a fabled weapon. Without those items, you won't be ready. I'm not really sure how we go about constructing those yet. I'm guessing we'll have to use these precious metals, the Heartland Tetrad. But other than that, I'm not really sure. So we've got game set up. We will come back to this in a minute. We've got a new little tracker card that we will need. Now, I don't have the cards for this expansion. I do have the cards for the base game, but I very quickly made uh, a couple, the more important ones. When I say made, I, I printed them out and then put them in card sleeves with a uh, card to back them. And that just so happens to be Star Trek The Next Generation, the collectible card game, the engineering pad. Shout out to anybody who is obsessed with that game in the 90s. These cards have been in my possession for about 30 years now, but at least they're proving to be useful. Anywho, this one here is this one here, and this is our round and month tracker. When you get out of the dungeon, you start to track time. Inside the dungeon, time has no meaning, I guess, and a foray into the dungeon counts as one round. We track rounds with a dice here. In fact, should we get it straight away? So we will start with round one, I guess. And then down here, we've got a month tracker. So each month comprises of six rounds. So every time that clicks over to six, we will uh, be recording a month there. In fact, I'm not sure we need those on yet. Maybe we don't. So anyway, so time is a thing. You'll track uh, months and years. There'll be 12 months in a year. I think there's end of month events or the possibility of end of month events and the possibility of end of year events, I believe. And in a round, you can do one of six things. You can plot a new area of the map so you can have an explore. You can begin constructing or upgrading a building that exists on a plot which you own. You can explore a discovered site or return to resolve an encounter because when you discover stuff, you don't necessarily have to deal with it straight away. So you can take one of your rounds to return to something you'd found previously and deal with it. Four is visiting the high actuary. And that's all about land ownership. If there is a chunk of land that is owned by a different lord and you want it, you can go to the high actuary and see if you can convince them to have the land transferred over to you, I guess. I haven't read that bit yet. Number five is exploring the dungeon. So you can return to the dungeon in the 2D6 dungeon original game, base game. Or finally, you can visit the town, which is something which is also in the base game. When you go into town, you can do a range of different activities. There you go. Hey, that wasn't too bad in terms of a very brief overview. I mean, I, I wonder whether we can just sort of get into it, really. There's obviously a lot more. I haven't read all of the new rules yet, but I think I have a moderately decent understanding of them. I think we can probably just get into it, can't we? Maybe that would be the best thing to do. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for setup, shall we? And I can show you the new sheets that we've got. I can fold that over because I can do that. I think I might have to move the camera slightly further away. Alrighty, here we go. Apologies if that's made anything hard to read, but you will just have to listen to my dulcet tones and hope that I remember to occasionally move things closer to you so you can get a better look. Game setup. So there's several sheets that you will need. Now, obviously, we've got our character sheet from the base game. That's got all our um, combat stuff, all of our items listed on it. But this game, fair warning, is a game that has quite... This is a 2D6 Realm, is a game that has quite a lot of bookkeeping. So if that is something that puts you off, 
this might not be one for you. But if it is something that you do not mind or you enjoy, then good news. So this is what we've got. We have a realm ledger, and this is where we record a bunch of things related to the realm. I don't understand all of this entirely quite yet, but we've got a money section. We need to transfer our money over from the dungeon onto this sheet. So we currently have, we, we, we've got quite a bit of money, which is good news. We've got 115 gold coins, 114 silver coins, 14 copper coins, and we've got a bunch of gems as well. So let's put these in this gem section. So there we go, we've got five medium quality pearls, two medium quality garnets, two medium quality sapphires, one medium quality emerald, and one low quality ruby. We've got a section for our income, which we don't have yet. High actuary roll modifiers. I'm not sure when that comes into play. We've got a tracker down the side for the current year. We're starting in the year 837. Then we've got an area for wellness. So your realm can be well or unwell. Some things will make your realm more well and some things will make your realm less well so for example if you've got a uh, monster rampaging across the realm and you have been unable to kill it that will probably decrease the wellness of your realm we've got an area for title claim area then our land owner title i believe we have a land owner title straight away all right, so I had to skip ahead slightly to the expanding your realm section. It says here you've gained the status of landowner and the title of governor. So I'm not sure where our status goes, but we've got a title section here, so I can write governor there. Then what else have we got? Not much else on this side. We've got Kaladir favor points because we have a new god. The other gods are recorded over here on the original sheet. We've got this new god here, Kaladir, who is the creator, sort of like the, the overarching main god, I guess. So we can track favor points for Kaladir here. Now we've got an area for secrets. I don't know what the secrets are about because when you start, they are secret. Then we have got an area, I think this is to do with secrets as well. And then we've got the other landowners. We've got a bunch of other landowners who are knocking about. And I guess we can give them gifts or receive gifts from them or give or receive threats. Haven't looked into that yet, but that is there. So that's the realm ledger. But we also need some other sheets. Now, I haven't decided whether I've printed these out too small yet. I think it's possible I have. We've got the land log, which is where you record uh, details of the uh, areas of land that you discover and choose to add to your realm. Obviously, we'll get to talking about that in a bit of detail. Any unclaimed land, so land that you yourself have not chosen to claim you record there so every new bit of land is recorded on that or that and then these two sheets here are for buildings we've got a building register here where you track the different buildings that you have and stuff related to those buildings and down here very similar but this is for houses and manor buildings so there you go we've got a bunch of sheets now we do need an overland map sheet, a blank land map, and I do not have one of those. I forgot to print it out. So I'm gonna go and get us a blank land map now. All right, I've had a little bit of a break between this bit of the video and the last bit of the video. You know, things happened, commitments occurred, days passed. But during that time, I did manage to print out the map sheet and here it is 
So each map page is numbered, and then if your exploration goes off the side of one sheet, then you would uh, label the corresponding number in one of these arrows and carry on on the next sheet. I don't know how many sheets it will end up covering. I don't really know how big the world ends up getting. But for now, all we need to do is mark our homestead in roughly the middle of one of these pages. So this will be map page number one, and then we're gonna draw our homestead. And I've got to make a decision about whether I'm gonna be drawing the sort of little isometric or the f easier flat options. You've got a sort of a low effort and a high effort or a low skill, high skill um, versions of all of the iconography that we will be using in the map. And obviously the first one is this homestead. So our homestead has a house, it has a little stable, and it has a wall around the outside. I, I guess we'll try for isometric. So I might, I might pause the video while I do the drawing. All right, I've had a little go. Here's our homestead, such as it is. So we've drawn our homestead. So that's it for setup, really. That is the game setup section. So the setup, at least, is not particularly onerous. Then we've got a few details about the land map and how that works. But I think we're just going to go into our first round. This will be round one of month one. And in our first round, we're just going to start exploring, I think. So if you remember, we can either explore we can construct, which we can't do yet because we've got nowhere to construct. We can explore a discovered site. We haven't discovered any. No point to visit the actuary. We don't want to go straight back to the dungeon. We've just been there. And we don't want to visit town. So we're going to get straight in on exploring. So here we are with the explore a new plot section. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll to determine the type of land. We're going to determine claim ownership. We're going to encounter the land. Then if we have written a larger plot, some plots are just the size of one of these squares. Other plots called plot areas take up more than one. So if we have found a plot area larger than four plots, we would then roll on a different table or one of some different tables. But let's crack on. First, we're going to roll to determine the type of land. To do that, we need to roll on TL81, our first cryptically uh, labelled table. Long may they continue. Types of land table one. Now, is that nearby? Maybe it's not. OK, so let's turn to the table index. I'm sensing I might need some little labels to put in here. TL81, Types of Land Table 1, is on 178. But actually, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, do I need to label this? I think maybe I do. I'm going to pop in a label. All right, so I've decided I'm going to put on a little label for this one. This is our tables index. But we're going to be using the types of land tables so frequently. 178, that I'm going to put in a little label there as well. So we have got a D66 table by the looks of things. I will be rolling red and blue dice in this playthrough. I can't remember if that's the same colours I used in the second 2D6 dungeon playthrough, the one I did most recently. People sometimes get a bit upset if I change dice colour, but I'll always be using them alphabetically. So the blue dice will be our tens and the red dice will be our ones. Here we go. What have we got first? First thing, I should say which direction I'm going. Doesn't matter too much, I guess, for this first one, but we're going to head up north. 44. A mound. So we've got a tag which is M-O, it is unique, and we've got a rank. I have read about all these things. I can't remember what they were all about. We're going to find out now. But first of all, we can draw our mound. Looks like that. 
There we go. Nice little mound there. Now we need to add a tag. This goes in the top right corner and it is a way for us to refer to and keep track of the different areas that we have come across. And it's going to be a number. This is going to be number one. And then the tag for the mound was MO. So there we go. This is one MO. And then we need to record the new plot or plot area in the land log or unclaimed land log if you choose not to or cannot claim the land. So we've got to think about land claiming, whether the land is going to be is going to belong to us or not. Before we do that, let's just note that this is a unique type of plot. It's only going to take up one square, unique types only take up one square and we can only have two unique plots next to each other. So now that that is a unique plot, we could have another one here, but we couldn't have two adjacent to this one. All right. And uh, there's an added complication with unique plots when you're working out their rank. Their rank is important for taxation, I believe. Essentially, when we have an encounter in this land, in this area, after we've worked out the ownership situation, when we have an encounter, it will tell us the base land type. So all unique plots have a base land type. So you might come across a mound. That mound might be in a meadow. It might be in a forest. And that affects your rank. And if this sounds complicated, I'm pretty confident that once we get through three or four different plots, this will start to be a little bit smoother. So claiming the land. So claiming land is key in 2D6 Realm. As soon as you reveal land, you must see if it is owned and therefore if you can claim it. You can only benefit from and build on claimed land that is part of your title claim area. We'll come back to that because I don't want to overload you with information too early on. As you claim land, you take on the responsibility for its upkeep and any benefits it may afford you, increasing your realm area. Once you know who owns the land, then you must encounter what is there by rolling on the appropriate encounter table. So here we go. To claim a plot or plot area, you must establish what the land is first. We've done that. Only then can you claim the plot or plot area. To do this, we're going to roll a d6. On a 3 to 6, there is no other claimant and you can include this land in your realm area. If you roll a 1 or 2, then the land has already been claimed by another land owner. Right, so we have got another land owner. To establish who the owner is, we roll on the LAIT1 landowner identity table. If the land type rank is three or higher, subtract two from the roll because the higher the quality of the plot, the more chance that someone of influence will have their greedy little mitts on it already. So our mound is a rank two, so it is not rank three or higher. That is good. So let's find out who owns this land. And at this point, we can also start to think about looking at the unclaimed land log, because this is where we're going to recall the land in this particular situation, because it's not going to belong to us, at least not initially. So this is plot one. M O the land type stroke base. Well, the land type is unique. We haven't yet worked out what the base is because that will be discovered when we go there to have an encounter. The size, I guess, is uh, one. The rank here is two, except we're going to be adding on to that rank based upon the base land type. Probably unique wasn't the uh, easiest one to start with. Oh, well, there you go. We've got a rank modifier. So I guess that's based on the 
base land type. Maybe other things modify the rank as well. And we're going to find out who the owner is. So this is a 2d6 table. Uh, there's a little note down here. If you roll the same landowner for another plot, you do not have to repeat the same quest. And instead, all plots that belong to that landowner fall under the same quest or situation. Oh, so we've got sort of like not only a, a landowner, but sort of a quest related to the landowner. 10. Governor Stoll Delgreen owns the land. He is happy to sell the land for half its value, for it is too far for, from his main realm. If you can give him two potions of any type... Oh, because he is studying alchemy. I'm not sure I'm going to want to give him my potions. Otherwise, he would have you complete a quest. Roll on QFLT1 and he'll gift it to you for free. It's a lot of information. Well, I guess we'll record that here. So I might, there's not a lot of room. It's making me regret not having made this table bigger. I don't think I'm gonna be able to fit enough in there. So I guess, am I gonna record the quest information here? I don't think I have a separate place to record different quests that I get. Yeah, unless I start a separate notes sheet, I'll try and fit something in here to start with. So I've written he will sell for half price if given two potions, or he'll want us to do a quest. So QFLT1 is our quest table. So here we are. And I'm kind of loving the fact that we are already deep into these tables. I thought we were just going to, you know, find a monster and have to kill the monster. But no, we found a plot of land. We know who the land belongs to. We've got some options, including a quest. And the quest is going to be number seven, sick daughter quest. The landowner is quite distressed and explains that their daughter is ill. They have their surgeons and herbalists at hand but still needs some ingredients gathered for her treatment. They require two Pazolki mushrooms and two Horzil mushrooms. If you have these or you can gather them, then you can complete the quest. I'm going to write a note uh, somewhere, I guess up here. All right, so I've written a little note about that. Mushrooms are a new ingredient type that have been introduced in this expansion. They've got different uh, effects and I guess we can use them to complete this quest as well. So there we go, that was our first turn. No, we're not finished, are we? We need to have the encounter. So if we turn back to the explore a new plot section, we have rolled to determine the type of land, we have determined land ownership, now we need to have an encounter on the land. So we need to turn to the encounter table for the mound land type. And I think I feel another little tag coming on because we're going to be turning to this quite a bit. So this is the land type encyclopedia. Now there's a whole bunch of things that we need to consider when uh, looking at a land type. I haven't read these in detail yet. I think I'm gonna to have to come back and try and absorb that. I'm having a scan through. There's definitely things there that I was already aware of from other pages. So I think we're just gonna to turn to the mound. Oh, there it is, perfect. And we've got a 2D6 table. We've got a tag abbreviation. We knew that already. Unique, rank two, we knew all that. Good, good. So we're gonna roll two dice and get ourselves an encounter. Nine. A ditch runs around the large grassy mound that looms over you. It is deep and seems as if it could conceal something or potentially be a hiding place. If you want to explore further, roll on this table. If you do, it takes some time and when you return to your realm, you find that a random house has caught a blaze. 
if you have no well within five plots, it takes five damage. Now, can that include your own place? Because that's obviously the only house I've got at the moment, is, is our own one. But I don't think it does. And there's a little bit of details about how to adjust the plot here. The plot remains a mound. Draw a ditch icon. The base land is grassland with a size of 75. So I think the size affects uh, your ability to build on it. So quite a lot to absorb there. Let's start by drawing a ditch because I feel like I can emotionally cope with the idea of drawing a ditch. There we go. I mean, that could be a ditch, ditch, it could be a fence, but we know that it is a ditch. Now, if we want, we could not explore it now and then we can optionally come back later. But if we come back later, it uses up a whole round of play rather than being incorporated into this initial uh, first exploration round that we got going on here. Right, I'm going to pause the video and see if I can work out whether our the house that will catch fire because we have been away too long exploring this mound could be our own compound. Okay, I've had a bit of a look through and I haven't really been able to establish whether our compound could be uh, caught on fire as a result of uh, this uh, encounter. Just seeing if there's anything else we need to track before we explore further using that table. So the base land is grassland and I'm not sure if that affects the rank particularly. It, that we've got this little table here of base land building modifiers. So that's how the base land affects the building. And there's various things. For example, in grassland, buildings cost 10% less to build and start with plus one HP. Because your buildings can get damaged, you see. Uh, so there is grassland. Right, I'm just going to... Right, let's just write down that we've got a base of grassland. Then let's turn back to the unique land type bit. Okay, so we do have to add the rank of the base land to the plot unless the unique plot type has been removed. All right, so that means we just need to have a quick look-see at the types of land table. We'll turn sideways here. Grassland has a rank of two, so that means we're gonna be doing a rank modifier of plus two for the grassland meaning that the overall rank for this land here is four. I don't think that really affects us while we don't own the land. And then the size we've got... Oh, well, no, we have got a size there as well. Ah, uh -huh. So I guess the size is more about uh, this value that we've been given here. So size 75. All right, again, I'm not too sure what that means yet, so we're not going to worry about that for the time being. But we are going to turn to table DEDIT1 and see if something else interesting happens here. And so my assumption is that my compound cannot be caught on fire. That might be wrong. I'm sure someone will let me know in the comments below if that is wrong, but just for uh, an easy life on this occasion that's the decision I'm going to make D-E-D-I-T-1 D-E-D-I-T-1 the deep ditch table brilliant 156 so rolling on the deep ditch table 4 there is a mass of webs caught up in the bottom of the ditch strung between a series of sharp stones they seem to be forming a circular hollow as you step forward, a large form lunges at you. You must fight a level appropriate giant spider. If you survive, you find a body in the webbing and we can roll on a table to maybe find some stuff. So we've got to fight a giant spider. So I suppose the question is, is the giant spider an enemy introduced in this book or is it an enemy from the original stuff. I'm not sure if there's a 
a way to actually establish that, but we can just have a look here and see if we can find a giant spider. Yes, we can. There is the giant spider. Right, so if I pop a little card there, here is our giant spider and we have our first encounter. So this all makes me think maybe I need to have a separate sheet where I'm just recording what's happening as we go. Or maybe I don't need to do that, but I, I do need to record the giant spider's health. And it said level appropriate. Is that what it said? Was that the wording it used? A level appropriate giant spider. OK, I wasn't able to uh, get to the bottom of the level appropriate stuff. But as it happens, this enemy is uh, of the same level as Bane, our character. And actually, <laughs> I'm still not quite used to facing level 4 creatures. I think I've only faced a couple of them. And they are quite scary. So this creature has 38 HP, which is just shy of my max. Uh, and Bane has incurred some damage, so Bane is on less HP at the moment. Quite a decent chunk of XP. So we've got this section in the new rules on experience point balance. So this uh, explains that if you kill a creature that is a lower level, you gain no XP. So you only gain XP if the creature is of the same or a greater level than you. This giant spider is of level 4, so we will be gaining a decent chunk of XP if we're able to kill it. It's got a shift of plus 2. Going to get a little bit of treasure there. Uh, so it's got an interrupt on primary 3s, 4s and 5s, minus 2 damage. So looking at our manoeuvres, our hue manoeuvre, which is our new one, has got a primary 4. In fact, they've both got primaries. So that means we're always going to be doing minus 2 damage. This could be a brutal fight. And the giant spider has got a claw jab on a 3-3. Does quite a lot of damage. And a web grenade on a 6-1. D6 plus 1 damage plus a special attack. Stuck, you miss the next round. Bread in the dungeon beneath the town. These spiders are seeded as eggs in the cave network. They grow to full size in the darkness, forming nests around the treasure they are left to guard. I'm not going to lie, I'm feeling a little bit intimidated by this enemy. I've decided I'm going to track health for it using some dice. So we'll set these d10 over here to 38. And settle in for what is probably... Oh! There's two giant spiders how did i just notice that you must have been shouting at the screen a level appropriate so we are going for the the more difficult giant spider because it is of the same level as us if we were of a lower level i guess we'd be facing a lower level giant spider well that's that mystery solved okay 38 points this is going to be pretty brutal isn't it i need the combat card now that i think of it there we go, there's our combat card. So th we're going into round one. So we've got no shift adjustment yet. If this means nothing to you, I would recommend popping back and watching my earlier 2D6 dungeon uh, videos where I spend a little bit more time going through what exactly combat means. So we have, I'm just looking at what we've got here to play with. We've got a magic potion that can gain us some health. We've got some magic scrolls that can gain us some health. Now I'm thinking I've also got some throwing axes. So we could also use a throwing axe, which gets us an additional attack. In fact, I think that's going to be essential. Oh, so we've got a throwing axe plus three. So I guess that one does more damage. So basically it automatically hits and we're going to roll uh, D66 and if the primary dice, so really I could technically only roll one but I'll roll two because that's what it says and I, I do what I'm told. If the primary dice 
matches the creature's primary interrupt, then there'll be no damage done. So that's pretty brutal. That means if our blue dice is a 3, a 4, or a 5, no damage. Ah, and there you go. Oh, this is going to be a disaster, isn't it? No damage from the throwing axe. And we can check at the end of combat to see whether we can recover that. Just made myself a little note to check that. Okay, so we're going to go into standard combat with us attacking first. Here we go. I'll keep it snappy. 4-1. Now our shift is 2. So we can we can shift to a hack, because we can shift that down to a 3 and that up to a 2. Unfortunately, as our attacks are always are going to incur minus 2 as a result of the web shield. So that is a given. So how much damage are we doing? No damage. Brutal. This is brutal. Okay, giant spider attacks back. 6-1. That's the web grenade, isn't it? Oh my god. D6 plus 1 plus special attack. At this point, I can point out that we can retreat from this combat because clearly this is going to be brutal. 1. That's lucky. So we're taking 2 damage down to 31. But in the next round, we are stuck by the web so we don't get to attack. Spider attacks in the next round. There's a 2-4. That can shift to a 3-3. Three, three, which is the claw jab. D6 plus 2. So that's 5 points of damage. This is redunculous. 36. Alright, on to the third round of combat. Maybe we'll get to do some damage now. What do you reckon? 5-2... That's not enough. No, no, yes it is, because that's a 2, so we can shift that down to a 3, doing a hack manoeuvre. 5 points of damage, less 2, so at least we've done something. We've done 3 points of damage, so that's going to take us down to 35. Spider attacks back. Hang on, I just put my health up, didn't I? Oh, that's annoying. I should have put my health down. Oh, okay, that's because I was supposed to go down to 26 when I wrote 36. You probably can't see that because it's too small. Right, that was me attacking. No, that was the spider attacking, wasn't it? And that, again, can go to a 3-3 three, three, doing a claw jab. It's eight points of damage. Right, I'm completely forgetting about my leather breastplate, which is a bit of a disaster. Oh, it could have blocked the point of damage off the web grenade because that is a 6-1 defence for my breastplate, which means I block a primary 6 and a secondary 1. I think, I think it's either or. Um, I'd have to check that. But that would definitely have blocked that. But we have now taken 8... Is that right? 8 points of damage? That's absolute madness. Going down to 18. I think we're going to have to run away. The spider is just brutal, and that's bad news, because that means this spider is now wandering around, having a negative effect on our realm. <laughs> oh my god, this is the first square, and I've already got a giant spider causing havoc. This is round four, This is I'm going to do one more round, and hope my luck changes, but this spider is brutal. Brutal, Toby, do you hear me? What are you playing at? Six, four. This is me attacking. Okay, we can get that to a four, four to do a hue attack. D six plus four. So that's six points of damage minus two. So that's four points of damage. This is just rubbish, isn't it? Down to thirty one. Spider's doing all right. Spider doesn't see uh, see what the big deal is with this combat. Spider attacks back. 4, 1. So we've now got a shift adjustment of 1, which means the spider's got a total of 3 shifts to play with. But actually, can quite easily shift that to a 6, 1, doing a web grenade. 
D6 plus 1 damage. Okay. Um, at least that's just 2 points of damage. But then we are stuck. Miss the next round. So the next round is round 5. We're getting 2 shift each. We are stuck, which presumably means we can't run away. So let's see if the spider does any damage. I've got a feeling it will, because apparently the spider does damage literally every round. Okay, so they can only sh uh, they can shift to a 3-3 three, three to do a claw jab. D6 plus 2 damage. 5 damage, taking me down to 11 points of health. Started at 33, just to be clear. Right, so round 6... I'm going to run away. I think the spider gets to do one parting shot as we're running away. Uh, when you retreat, the creature you are fleeing from has one last attack before you escape. This means the creature you are fighting remains on the plot, which cannot be built on. You can come back later if you wish to defeat the creature. I'll, I'll be back, giant spider, don't you worry. Uh, you must also place the Atrophy Undefeated Creature in the Realm Wellness, which as per normal gives a modifier of minus one. So every time you leave an undefeated creature in a plot, you gain another of the same. So this makes our realm less safe. Um, I haven't... Uh, I have read the bit about Realm Wellness, but I'm going to have to remind myself, but let's let's first allow the spider its final attack. Here we go. 4-3, so easily can go to a 3-3 three, three claw jab, 2 plus 2, an additional 4 damage, because why not? Taking me down to 7, 7 points of health, absolute insanity. Alright, we've, we've escaped the giant spider, we need to, sorry I'm just reeling from how brutal that was. So I guess we need to make a note here. But it's not in my claimed land, is it? So it's not going to have a negative effect on my realm, because it's not in my realm. Okay, so I'm going to make a note that the giant spider is here. Now, does he return to full health? I don't really know. I'm going to assume for now that the spider remains at the level of health that we left it at. But I'm going to also assume that we lose the combat fatigue dice because otherwise that would just be a step too far in terms of what you are tracking. So I'm not going to record the atrophy undefeated creature in the realm wellness because the spider is not in my realm. My realm is the land which we have laid claim to and recorded in the land log here. But I think I need to have a little break after that, folks. I suspect we're going to have to return to town in the next video and try and heal Bane a little bit. I don't know if I can use potions outside of combat. So yeah, we'll come back in another video. We'll go into town, we'll try and heal Bane up, and we'll go into a new area... We'll do a bit more exploring and hopefully come across an encounter that is marginally less deadly than the one we just had. Anyway, folks, hope you enjoyed that. Hope you enjoyed seeing me get my ass handed to me by a giant spider. See you in the next video. Bye for now.